Earlier this week, Dragon Ball got some exciting news with the very first teaser trailer for the new Dragon Ball Super movie. Some people were excited, some were upset because of the CGI, and yet all I could think about this week was this. <laughs> That's right, this week I was reading through some of the best original Dragon Ball has to offer, and no, I'm not talking about Raditz through to Majin Buu, I'm talking about the original arcs that comprise the beginning of this story. Or, as I like to affectionately refer to it as, Oh my god, this is like 40% of the friggin' story, how has no one seen this? It's amazing! But yes, uh, you heard me right, most people haven't seen about 40% of the story. The Red Ribbon Army has returned and- Oh, we saw Z, who that? Stretching from the Pilaf saga all the way through to Piccolo Jr., it's easily one of the most underrated stories in all of manga and anime that I know of. And with the majority of people now focusing on the latest transformations, chapters, and trailers for the upcoming movie, I figured it should be my responsibility to show people where this series came from and why it's widely considered by those that have read it some of the absolute best material this series has to offer. That's right, I'm talking funny, I'm talking action-packed, I'm talking, hey mom, go to the store to get some tissues because Goku's making me cry. And you know what? They didn't need to create a multiverse tournament or make constant callbacks to itself to get a reaction from its audiences either. This is an immortal story with legacy, action, comedy, and sadness. And quite simply, this original tale set the foundation for the story that will go on to capture the hearts and minds of millions across the world for decades to come. Which is why I am so nervous writing this video. This is a cultural touchstone of a story and I want to do it justice. So what are we waiting for? I'm totally not Mark and this is my review of Akira Toriyama's underrated and undefeated Dragon Ball. Truth be told, I'm actually unreasonably excited to get into this with all of you today. So, let's dive into the very first saga that catapulted Dragon Ball into Japanese pop culture. I'm talking about the 23 chapter long Pilaf Saga. <laughs> God, it feels so strange but amazing to be back in this world with new eyes. After having spent the last decade learning about storytelling, one of the first things that immediately became apparent to me was how effective Toriyama was at characterization, particularly with both Goku and Bulma right off the bat, utilizing paneling, framing, and dialogue to push this aspect of his story. You can absolutely tell that this isn't his first manga either. While the story is very simple, it is so for specific measured reasons. The first chapter kicks off her story with the famous and effective first meeting of Goku and his soon-to-be lifelong friend, Bulma. And I call this scene effective because, while Toriyama has made plenty of questionable writing decisions throughout his long career, I don't believe he could have handled this first chapter any better. The priority of the first chapter, typically, is to introduce us to and bond us with the main characters of the arc, and immediately Toriyama highlights how these two characters he created are exact opposites of each other. Goku is physically strong, but innocent and naive. Bulma is physically physically weak in comparison, but is much more experienced and on another intellectual level to Goku altogether. With their first decisions made in this story not wasting any time in their characterization, acting as a window into who these people really are. Goku is inquisitive with some shockingly friendly and naivety thrown into the mix. His first action is to attack and use his brawn to overcome the obstacle. All the while Bulma, after reflexively going for her gun, a mechanical enhancement, her first thought is to try and manipulate Goku into handing over his Dragon Ball and to help her on her quest. This is our starting point and it tells us so, so much about who these characters are and what possibilities might lie ahead in their story together. Furthermore, I was delighted to see Toriyama's brilliant use of paneling used to reinforce this avenue of characterization. More traditionally, I really appreciate how Toriyama uses his layouts to build anticipation for a page turn. This is a minor example, and I'll show more as the stakes rise over the course of the story, but this page with Goku overlooking a cliff, it's a tall and narrow panel with Goku pictured quite small atop of it. And it's given this real estate to tell us, quite simply, that this cliff is extremely tall, and on that same page, Goku is shown not to care about that as he jumps down with ease, communicating that this isn't a normal everyday boy. It's a small choice, but it sure as hell beats someone lecturing to us that he's some freakishly strong kid. And on the topic of visuals, the first chapter has one of my favorite panels in all of the story. This one. 
This image on its own, to me, acts as a microcosm of what Goku will do in the story moving forward. His outward appearance will make someone think one thing, and then they will quickly be taken off guard by something they did not expect from him. Bulma up until this point, and even on this very panel's page, has been contemplating and formulating a plan to exploit Goku. She's seen it all before and she feels like she knows exactly what's coming. And as Goku proceeds into his modest living quarters, Bulma doesn't find someone living there with him. She doesn't find anything she might be expecting. Instead, she sees a small boy earnestly praying before a totem representing his deceased Grandpa Gohan. The Four Star Ball. I love this image. Bulma does continue to try and exploit Goku's understanding and innocent nature for her benefit, but this panel marks the moment she starts to build some sort of bond with the character. Moving on from that opening, I think it's important to point out that this arc is unlike any other Dragon Ball arc that will come after it. It's clear that Toriyama went into this with a specific vision, one that was inspired largely by the Chinese story Journey to the West, with characters like Goku, Oolong, and Yamcha, among others, encountering fantastical beings clearly inspired by the aforementioned story. And across these opening 23 chapters, Goku and Bulma travel across the globe in search of these magical orbs called Dragon Balls. Title drop. All in an effort so that Bulma can make a wish for a perfect boyfriend. You heard me right, she wants to wish for a boyfriend. Oh, how the times have changed, you might be saying. In pursuing these orbs, they meet Oolong, who was this weird shape-shifting pervert. We meet Yamcha and Poor as they attempt to rob Goku and Ko in the desert, as well as a litany of bizarre and crazy characters like Boss Rabbit, an individual in charge of a gang of rabbit cosplaying thugs that also possesses the power to turn individuals like Bulma into a carrot. This first arc is off-the-wall bonkers, bouncing from iconic scenes to comedic scenes to outright strange scenes, but what ties them all together is the strong focus on comedy that this first arc primarily basks in. The original Dragon Ball, particularly this first saga, is very comedy focused, with entire scenarios sometimes being built around a single joke. And these jokes have layers to them. Not layers of any intellectual complexity, definitely not, but <laughs> layers of loose narrative complexity. And I mean that, for instance, despite many of you not having seen this part of the story, you may have seen this particular scene. Alright, so this one gag highlighting the innocence of Goku in this crazy situation has the knock-on effect whereby it informs and drives the plot through a secondary gag with Roshi later on, convincing him to hand over his Dragon Ball. Later again, after Bulma loses the capsules with her clothes and supplies, she has to borrow a dumb outfit from Oolong. It's a shallow gag, but funnily enough, it informs much of the humor behind the hijinks that takes place in the village with Boss Rabbit running the roost. This town they wander into has been terrorized by this gang that dresses up as rabbits, and when the townsfolk start to give Bulma a wide berth because of what she's wearing, she assumes the only possible conclusion is that they're intimidated by her beauty. All of these scenarios, the stuff with Goku, Roshi, Oolong, and eventually Boss Rabbit, are all examples of comedic moments that only work when we know the characters involved. Bulma scaring people while dressed as a playboy bunny is a funny visual on its own, but it's even more funny when you know that this was the only outfit that Oolong had extra in his car, and it's made even funnier again when you realize that Bulma is so egotistical that she convinced herself that it made perfect sense that people were treating her this way because she was so beautiful. Now, is it stupid and borderline creepy given Bulma's age in the material and the age of the mangaka drawing it? Yeah, definitely maybe, but it's still made in lighthearted fun and layered through character, narratively pushing the story forward. People nowadays love to take Dragon Ball very seriously, whether it be its theme, story, or messaging, and this story no doubt means a lot to tons and tons of different people across the world. But at the end of the day, this story, particularly this material in the arc, was written as a comedy first and foremost, not to be taken very seriously at all. I mean, there's an entire page with the Pilaf gang dedicated to talking about and making meta jokes concerning Toriyama's prior work in Dr. Slump. That and also, Goku sent Boss Rabbit to the moon using his Nyobo, or Power Pole, or whatever you want to call it. Makes you wonder what happened to him when... Yeah, 
Alright, so before I dive into my absolute favourite aspect of this first arc, I think I should rattle off some of the iconic scenes and honourable mentions I have also. I loved how cute and innocent both Goku and Chi Chi's first encounter was, and I love how the way their dialogue is written accentuates their rural backgrounds and sensibilities, not only by creating some endearing character writing, but forcing us as readers to see similarities between the two of them on a foundational, fundamental level as Goku's obliviousness clashes with Chi Chi's traditional ideal. The dynamic is honestly perfect. From a lore standpoint, it also acts as the first place we see Goku's tail acting as a significant weak spot in the series. Moving on, the first Kamehameha in the series is absolutely top tier. These big page spreads from Akira Toriyama absolutely hit different compared to so many other mangaka both past and present to me. Furthermore, in addition to this scene's stunning visuals, we get to see Goku nail the Kamehameha almost immediately after seeing Roshi use it once. This marks the moment Roshi saw Goku as a special prospect, going as far as to offer him training once he's ready. Oh my god. Is that foreshadowing? Uh, I, I think it is. <laughs> All right, now time for my favorite part of the first arc. While I enjoyed the first arc story in a lighthearted, passive fashion up until this point, it wasn't until this arc's climax that Dragon Ball became what I recognized as Dragon Ball. And while it's still not in its final form just yet, I'll get to that in the next arc, it still showed signs of heading in that direction. This change in narrative direction wasn't a mistake either, and there's some really interesting behind the scenes info regarding how Toriyama and his editor at the time, Torishima, saw this issue that I am totally gonna talk about in like two minutes. Narratively, however, I think this is the arc's strongest section. There's a wonderful culmination of plot threads that create a beautiful martini of circumstance, particularly during this instance where Pilaf has stolen all of the Dragon Balls they collected and trapped them in this chamber with the ceiling exposed to the sky, readying them to be baked under the hot morning sun once it eventually rose. Sitting there while waiting for death, they begin chatting about the moon's beauty until Goku starts talking about his experience with the moon. And in doing so, he begins telling them a story of a monster his grandpa warned him about that comes out during a full moon. Having been exposed to the otherworldly strength of Goku, his heightened senses, and the sudden death of his grandpa Gohan, this is when the characters sharing the chamber with him, as well as us at home, start to understand what tragic event transpired that day. <laughs> It's superbly subtle and effective, particularly for a manga that prioritizes gags and action above this sort of character-rich experience. And it's this sort of dedication to slowly unveiling the world, building it up over time, that gave Dragon Ball this mystical magic and fun feel during this period, as well as moving forward, designing characters that are exact opposites of each other and transporting them through this adventure, not with any specific goal in mind necessarily, but to see how this experience impacts them personally. In the case of Goku, we learn all of this new information about him, and in the case of Bulma, she gains some new friends and maybe more. By the way, I love this page where Bulma and Yamcha both recognize that they were exactly what each other were looking for all along. The page layout is great and visually communicates what it needs to in a childish and endearing manner. You know, after Oolong wishes for panties. Which is another great moment and page, I guess. However, what many of you might not know is that during this time, the ending portion of the Pilaf saga, sales for Dragon Ball dipped noticeably or experienced a lull, according to Kazuhiko Torishima, Dragon Ball's editor that worked alongside Toriyama. And to remedy this, apparently, Torishima turned to study Fists of the North Star, the most popular manga at the time. And after reading it, he identified three areas where Dragon Ball could improve moving forward. Number one, the first thing they did was cut down the number of characters. Throughout the first arc, Toriyama had introduced a large number of new characters like Goku, Bulma, Oolong, Yamcha, Puar, Roshi, Turtle, Ox King, Chi Chi, Mai, Shu, Pilaf, as well as the numerous other villains they encountered along the way. And so, when moving into the next arc of the story, together they decided to have a much smaller, more focused cast centered around Goku, Roshi, and the newly introduced Krillin. The second thing they wanted to focus on was to increase the coolness factor, which also flows naturally into the third thing they wanted to change. They wanted to break the established convention of the series. Part of the reason sales declined, Torishima suspected, was due to the formula that appeared in the first arc. Once the genie was out of the bottle, or in this case dragon, fans got the impression that they knew what direction the series would go in. And so the tournament saga was born, ushering in a new era of manga and in turn establishing Dragon Ball as a force to be reckoned with. The rise of Dragon Ball had begun. Look! 
く使える100点デスクじゃセリオライトの一等機学習デスク女の子にはこんな可愛い机Training with Roshi. To say that this arc influenced other popular series yet to come would be an understatement. After having taken on the philosophy of less is more from Fists of the North Star and a quick trip abroad to look at some ruins and ancient architecture, Akira Toriyama was primed to inject Dragon Ball with the same vigor, passion, and action it would become famous for in the not so distant future. And it all starts with this little boy asking this old perverted man. To train him. Like the first arc enjoyed, this one also has a strong focus on the more lighthearted aspects of the series, particularly through new characters and their introductions. Instead of telling us what sort of people these characters are clunkily, the vehicle of comedy helps us understand them more. For instance, soon after Goku arrives on the island and fails to locate a woman for Roshi, Krillin makes his grand entrance onto the scene. <laughs> He comes across as a more self centered individual initially, thanks to a certain comedic moment courtesy of Goku's cloud. In addition to that, another character we get to know in this arc is that of Lunch or Launch in the dub. She's a character tailor made for Uri Dragon Ball with her sneezing offering up tons of comedic hijinks. But my favorite joke from her more subdued innocent side comes by way of Roshi's desperate persuasion attempt to make her wear a specific. <clears throat> uniform. After coming out dressed in what she was given, Lunch asks if maybe the packages got mixed up? We then hard cut to the three guys all peddling this same charade wearing the same uniform, and in response to this, Roshi humbly requests that she please don't insult the traditional uniform of the Kame school, as he leers lecherously towards her, flanked by a visibly confused Goku that's taking all of this a little too seriously. Much the same way a strong emphasis was placed on the differences between Goku and Bulma early on. On, Krillin acts in the first half of this arc as the foil to Goku with a strong distinction made between them almost immediately. Firstly, through his failure to board the magical cloud, but also his less than heroic saving of lunch, and most importantly, through the training he received from Roshi. And speaking of which. <laughs> I loved the training of Krillin and Goku. Their dynamic is pitch perfect for what this arc is calling for and acts as a strong first indication of the insecure antagonistic character type that will become more and more commonplace around Goku moving forward, bouncing well off of his innocent and honest persona. Roshi's introductory challenge, the foot race, is a terrific example of why this character type and why this version of Krillin is entertaining and effective. Taking turns, Krillin explodes off the mark first, completing the 100 meter dash in a little over 10 seconds. An impressive effort, no matter who you are. However, what makes this a great opportunity for characterization is what Toriyama has given these characters to say to each other in response to their respective efforts. With Krillin, this gave us a great indication as to where his ideals and goals lie, basking in the impressive time he set, gloating about it both to Goku, Roshi, and even internally to himself. Whereas with Goku, once he sets an even faster time, he doesn't gloat. Instead, his first instinct is to genuinely ask if that was fast. In the next challenge, when it came to retrieving the rock Roshi threw, Krillin and Goku are first of all faced with descending a certain cliff face. However, we know from the first chapter that this is no issue for Goku, and watching as surprise descends over Krillin's face is the first instance of another trick soon to become commonplace in the Dragon Ball story. This is a narrative tool called dramatic irony. We know what Goku is capable of, but new characters like Krillin in this instance don't. It is fun and somewhat cathartic at this point, but later this same technique will be used to effectively depict Goku as a monstrous threat to the ignorant adversaries of the future. Furthermore, this whole challenge is a brilliantly constructed scene narratively, with more moving parts than you might actually anticipate from an early Dragon Ball story. Krillin, knowing full well that there are tons of people living on this island that they've moved to for training, instead of finding the rock that Roshi threw in a race with someone he knows he'll lose against, Krillin decides to try to borrow a marker and find a similar looking rock to fake his successful retrieval. Roshi does throw the rock back into his face, but it's a good idea that involves thinking outside of the box. Krillin honestly impressed me here, but he's also demonstrating a character flaw that will always mean Goku will be better than him if he doesn't shake this sensibility. Despite this admittedly clever idea, however, he's forced to search in earnest for the rock, but to no success once again. Goku finds it. However, through some more underhanded and clever use of strategy, he outthinks Goku and distracts him with a fake rock. This whole interaction and challenge was a fun little exchange that highlights Goku's weak spots also. A weak spot he'll have for a very, very long time in some shape or form. He trusts his opponents too much. 
But that's enough of these warm-ups. It's time for some serious Roshi training. One does not strive for victory over an opponent. One strives to avoid defeat by one's own self. In the beginning of this final set of trials, Roshi announces to the two young boys that in eight short months, they will be participating in the Tenkaichi Budokai, a world martial arts tournament. And what makes this sequence interesting, for me at least, isn't exclusively how powerful these two stand to become or the amazing techniques they will learn while training under Roshi. In fact, they don't really learn any techniques at all beyond what they already arrived with. Instead, there's a strong focus on philosophy. Through the intense manual labor, education, and effort put in over over these months, fans of Dragon Ball Super might recognize a particular quote. Sitting in a hammock alongside the first pupils he's taken on in a very, very long time, he tells them to move well, study well, play well, eat well, rest well. That is the Turtle Master way. There are a number of brilliant quotes from this training mini arc, but my favorite is the one I started this section with. One does not strive for victory over an opponent, one strives to avoid defeat by one's own self. It summarizes succinctly what I love about this story and Roshi's teachings particularly. He talks about using the power acquired through this practice for the betterment and protection of others. To never strive with the single-minded view of winning against your opponent, but to instead not fall into the pitfalls such elusive thinking will lead you down. To always look past that and to always strive to better yourself regardless of the immediate goal or outcomes you face. It's a powerful and resilient philosophy that Toriyama has baked into the foundation of this franchise, and a perfect piece of serious and useful philosophy amidst the silliness of this action-adventure comic. The Tenkaichi Budokai. This is the first tournament in the Dragon Ball series. However, for those of you that know this series well, you'll know that this isn't by any means the last. Not in any stretch of the imagination. The broader Dragon Ball story these days is somewhat synonymous with tournament arcs of various shapes and sizes. Whether they be these Tenkaichi Budokai, more intimate affairs like with Baba later on in the story, the Cell games, or even to varying degrees in the wider universe. Dragon Ball's roots are very much in these tournament arcs it helped to popularize, and it started all here. And it starts with a bang. On the back of that important philosophy lesson is the two boys' very first test in the big bad world. And the test isn't necessarily the tournament itself, which honestly was kind of interesting. The significance this tournament represents is once more embedded in the philosophy that to truly be a master of martial arts, you need to always be learning and improving. And if either Goku or Krillin were to win this tournament and be crowned strongest under the heavens, they might not learn that lesson. And given what Roshi has seen them do during their training, he needs to come up with a solution to this potential problem. Fast. Now, when you say tournament arc, a surface level analysis of that statement might lead you to believe that this setting only offers fights, and while it does offer those in abundance, it's more than anything else a simple backdrop that allows the story and characters to shine brighter due to the various scenarios it can readily provide. Similar to the setting of a high school, tournaments are a familiar and easy to understand setting for readers. These settings create natural scenarios for central or relevant characters to come into conflict with each other, and in the case of the shonen action Action genre, a tournament arc is tailor-made for that sort of story. As readers, this is our first time encountering a world tournament in the universe of Dragon Ball, much the same way this is Krillin and Goku's first time. And these qualifying rounds in the tournament for the eight main tournament spots available act also as the bridging of any gap there might exist between Krillin and the audience. A character that was once an antagonist to our hero Goku is now much closer to the endearing, self-conscious, and apprehensive character we're familiar with today. In addition to him acting early on as the audience his surrogate in this too being his first world tournament, asking all of the sort of questions we as readers would ask, he too is confronted by the group he fled from, one that exhibits all the characteristics he had towards the beginning of this arc. In other words, we're made aware of the people who made Krillin the person he was. They are slimy, cruel, and they are fighting Krillin in the qualifiers. <laughs> Yeah, that felt good. Goodbye, old Krillin, hello, bold new world. And really, these qualifiers here are all about catharsis and context. It allows us as an audience the opportunity to take stock of how capable these boys are after the grueling and laborious training they underwent for the better part of a year against all of these strongest fighters in the world. With little effort, Goku and Krillin qualify along with a returning short-haired Yamcha for the final eight. Next up are the quarterfinals. 
As it pertains to this tournament's various heats, the quarterfinals are probably the ones with the greatest emphasis on comedy and really, for me, are the weakest of the arc. Now, that's not to say that I didn't have fun reading this section or that it doesn't have strong moments, it most definitely does. Like Yamcha versus Jackie Chun, for instance. But fights like Bacterium versus Krillin and Goku versus Giren are very clearly there to primarily dish out some comedic relief, which is fine, but I would have liked a little more drama personally. But yeah, Krillin's first serious outing, as I said, is against an apparent formidable adversary called Bacterium, a giant man whose edge comes from his refusal to ever bathe. There's some great paneling by Toriyama here that will become more commonplace as we press forward too, with the contrast emphasized between the tiny hero and the giant bully right before he's defeated. With that said, the fight comes to a close thanks to Goku reminding Krillin that he doesn't have a nose and therefore can't smell him. Finish him. Fatality. Next up is Yamcha vs Jackie Chun, and it is my favourite of the fights from this section. It's here we're made aware that Roshi under an alias and disguise has entered himself into the tournament to prevent the two boys from winning and losing their motivation for improvement. Told from the point of view of Yamcha, we follow him as he's totally overpowered by the older martial artist in Jackie Chun. There's some great panel work, but it's probably the shortest fight in all of these main contests. <laughs> Namu vs Ramfan is a strange one. As a reader, you'd be forgiven for wondering why we're dedicating time to this conflict. It doesn't involve any character we've been introduced to, and so Toriyama offered this up as an opportunity to not necessarily focus on Namu, though he does sort of, but to instead leverage his noble intentions that we do learn about him to build up Roshi's character instead. Through this Namu character, we learn how much Roshi may very well be capable of as he uses his mysterious abilities to read Namu's mind, and in addition to that, we learn of the horror horrible circumstances after befalling his village. Waiting on him to return with water after he wins the tournament prize money, his goal is to save his village. And that motivation, despite Ranfan's best effort, was enough to help him claim the victory over her. <laughs> Goku vs Giran is the last fight before the semis, and to be honest, this was the fight I liked the least in this section. It's still perfectly fine, but there's a lot of strange goings on, like Goku using Kintoin to save himself from falling out of bounds. I mean, to me, that feels like cheating. I suppose the most significant thing to come out of this match is that Goku grew his tail back, but even then, Goku doesn't knock Giran out of bounds or anything. Giran quits out of fear. It's very unsatisfying. The semi-finals. All right, we've got four remaining contestants vying for the first place spot. Goku, Krillin, Namu, and Jackie Chun. Three matches remain before we crown a winner, so let's dive in. Krillin versus Jackie Chun. This first match of the semi-finals is honestly a classic Dragon Ball fight. There's some iconic Toriyama paneling, but trust me, you've seen nothing yet. This conflict also has a brilliant gag which parodies those old kung fu films. You know those moments where two warriors rush past each other, we see effectively nothing happen, and then out of seemingly nowhere, one of them falls after apparently being attacked incredibly quick. It's a famous and somewhat cliche trick, and Toriyama decides to deconstruct this concept until all that's left is utter absurdity. As Quillen and Roshi, I mean, Jackie Chun utilize the same attack resulting in Krillin being downed, per the request of the ref, they then attempt to explain everything that happened in approximately 0.2 seconds of action in excruciating detail, intentionally slowing the pace of the fight down in hilarious fashion. Everything from kicks, punches, spitting, booger flicking, or even rock, paper, scissors transpired during that exchange apparently, and it's a great gag. The highlight of this fight, for me anyway, has to be when Krillin surprises Jackie and sends him flying out of the ring, forcing him him to use his secret weapon, the Kamehameha, to propel himself back into the arena. It's awesome. After that effort, Krillin didn't have much left, and in the end, Jackie Chun proved to be too much for the young warrior. <laughs> Chun advances to the finals. Goku vs Namu's semi-final bout was interesting for me for one main reason. It acted as a clear and effective way to show what sort of powerhouse Goku really is. Taking techniques he'd just seen moments prior and utilizing them in battle with Namu made it look as though Goku was barely trying. Aside from Krillin and Roshi, Namu would have been the strongest man to participate with in this tournament and to see Goku steamroll through him like this created an aura around his character I wasn't at all expecting from this story going into what should be the biggest moment in his life. Needless to say, Goku wins. He advances to the finals against Jackie Chun in dominating fashion. The finals. 
This is and remains one of the best fights the series has ever produced and it's a crime that most people that have seen Dragon Ball Z don't even know that this fight exists. Contained within this one fight are what will eventually become staples of the franchise that to this day are still being used. There's an interesting interview with Toriyama's editor Torishima that I think brings to light the reason why a tournament setting was ultimately chosen to act as the backdrop for the climax to their sophomore outing in this manga. Nothing from Fist of the North Star pointed towards a tournament arc necessarily, so what was it? Well, it was Akira Toriyama's art style. According to Torishima, Tetsuo Hara, the artist behind Fist of the North Star, was particularly great at illustrating still or static images, and so Torishima wondered if Hara had to keep this in mind when drawing his manga, playing to his strengths resulting in Kenshiro poking holes through his opponents and making them stagger to the right. There's not a lot of movement, but it was so cool according to Torishima. And so, once he realized this, he thought to angle the coming arc according to Akira Toriyama's greatest illustrative talent his ability to depict three-dimensional movement. Toriyama's level of spatial awareness when it comes to these fights was what drew me as a reader and a fan into these stories in the first place, and largely what set the series apart from other action shonen of the time. Keeping these aspects of Akira Toriyama's talents in mind, they needed a place to easily demonstrate themselves, and what better place to show how powerful and competent Goku became than on a flat three-dimensional stage at the Tenkaichi Budokai. On this stage, Akira Toriyama was free to make full use of the space, whether it be through jumping, flying, lunging, spinning, or whatever his brain could conjure. And this fight between Roshi and Goku set the standard for what many other manga from that point onward would try to emulate. An aspect of this fight that I think is easily overlooked is how so much of it is taken from Roshi's point of view. From the internal dialogue to the point of view and narrative direction. The narrative is less saying can Goku pull out the victory here, but more so can Roshi achieve what is best for Goku in defeating him in this contest. On top of that remaining true to the initial mission statement of the Turtle School and its philosophy, it really helps to build up and establish Goku as this mountain of an adversary early on in the bout, which in turn helps to build tension in the fight towards its climax, forcing us to watch on as an audience conflicted as Roshi cycles through and dives deep into his big bag of tricks with Goku, finding every answer to the techniques the old Herman had acquired over a very, very long career in mere seconds. It's an astounding fight, and it's not done yet. Due to the fight's length and subsequently Roshi's inability to put Goku away early, night falls over the arena and the moon comes out, forcing Roshi to contend with the impossibly difficult task of Great Ape Goku, now destroying the tournament grounds. And contend with him he most certainly does, in fittingly ridiculous Dragon Ball fashion might I add, by using almost all of his energy to blow up the moon. Uh Rip Boss Rabbit, I guess? <laughs> Ultimately, this leaves both Roshi and Goku almost completely drained of energy with one good attack left in each competitor. And the means with which this fight ends is still, to this day, genius in my mind. It's so simple, it meant that there was a winner declared, but with no one person having lost any standing with us as an audience. Ever the cunning strategist, at the last moment, Roshi notices an advantage he has over Goku. One that no matter what, the young boy couldn't possibly overcome. His lack of height and reach. For the very last time in this bout, they dash and move to attack each other, and this time both fall after their respective blows land. But ultimately, Roshi dealt the most damage thanks to Goku's lack of reach, leading to a graze instead of a solid connection on the Turtle Hermit. This fight was a brilliant use of every single attribute that makes Akira Toriyama's stories and battles impressive, and revisiting it for me was a tremendous treat. Having not looked at it in close to 10 years, returning to it with fresh eyes, I am happy to say that not only is it as good as I remember, but it's better. The focus this arc places on the character of Roshi is stupendous, from his comedic value to his competency as a martial artist to his generosity as a human being. This arc was a true tour de force proclaiming to the world that Dragon Ball has arrived. And let me tell you, it was only just getting started. Face.